May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time to learn a little Latin. All you need to do is open up that worship folder again to that first page where worship began, page three, and you'll see the symbol with four letters VDMA around the cross. That symbol and those letters, VDMA, stand for the Latin words, as explained there, verbum domini monet in aeternum. In Latin, they pronounce a V like a W. Verbum domini monet in aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. That comes from Isaiah chapter 40. And it's also quoted by the Apostle Peter in his first letter. For Martin Luther, the word of God was living and active, proclaiming that sinners have right standing with God, even though they don't deserve it, and that same word has the power to create faith in hearts to believe that it's true. And so, this Latin phrase, VDMA, Verbum Domini Modit in Aeternum was of special significance in the Lutheran Reformation. In fact, as early as 1522, a ruler in one of the German territories called Saxony ordered that everyone should have that slogan sewn onto the uniform from soldiers to servants. And a few years later, when political forces aligned to attack biblical truth and biblical teaching, Lutheran princes formed an alliance, formed a league, and adopted that as their motto, their slogan, VDMA, Verbum Domini Monet in Aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. Why? Because what they meant by that was they might lose a battle or two, but the good news of Jesus Christ proclaimed throughout the scriptures cannot be conquered. Do you think that Christianity is under attack in our world? Do you feel that what you believe is under the gun? With Satan driving the anti-God forces of culture and society like a team of horses trampling what we believe, it's tempting to hunker down and hide, hoping that Jesus will come in Judgment Day and hopefully real soon. But what about others whom God wants to save? What about God's desire to pluck other sinners from Satan's claws and plop them into the safety of his arms? Do you think God wants his church to grow? And if so, how? How does God's church grow? That's the question plunked onto our hearts by the three scripture readings you heard me read from the lectern, in particular, the second reading from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Not asking how we can hide, but how does God's church grow? The answer, VDMA. Verbum Domini Monet in Aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. The gentle roll of the hills, shimmering trees lining crystal clear creeks, farm fields stretched like bedsheets over the horizon. You pull over, get out, and go for a stroll along a worn and weathered fence. But what catches you by surprise and grabs your attention as you stroll toward a recently plowed field is that there's a conversation going on between clumps of dirt. Oh, I remember when horses used to plod on our backs and leave their hoof prints on top of us. If our farm is going to flourish again, I think we have to go back 
to the horses. Ah, oh, old timer, you're loopy. Tractors are the way to go. A third clump chimed in. I remember the farmer before this one. I think he was better because he seemed to care about each one of us in the clump family. Another said, that may be your opinion, but I actually prefer the farmer before that because he made sure that we always had plenty of water. The first old clump jumped back into conversation. You can have your disagreements and your opinions, and I might prefer the horses and you might prefer tractors. But you have to admit, and I think we should probably agree, well, you probably, probably won't, that this farmer, current farmer's idea to plant us one year with corn and the next year with soybeans is the best way in which my clump muscles rejuvenate and are restored. Strange conversation, wouldn't you say? But you get back in your car and you're driving down the country lane and you start thinking about that conversation. And it dawns on you, how stupid, how pointless the arguing when it is God who is in control of farms and fields and clumps of dirt. Farms only flourish by God's power and God's blessing. A report had come to the Apostle Paul about that kind of quibbling in Corinth. Some members of the congregation jumped on the ideas of other people because those other ideas did not match their own opinions and their own agenda. And they were at each other's throats. Some of them said, I follow Paul. And another said, I follow Apollos. How is that going to help the church grow? So Paul writes to them, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The congregation in Corinth grew outwardly in numbers and inwardly with stronger faith, not because of the preachers or by the people listening, but because of only one thing, V-D-M-A, verbum domini monet in aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever, and that word is powerful. Bickering and complaining and quarreling and quibbling, what good could that do? Wouldn't it only cause Satan to go snickering up his sleeve? Factions among the people in the congregation in Corinth only led to them missing out on the main point, and the main point is not who's right, but what's right. And what's right is V-D-M-A, verbum domini modet in aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. That's what's right. Flames jumped up from the charcoals. Ice tinkled in the glasses. Moisture trickled down the outsides of the cocktail tumblers during the backyard barbecue hosted by Bill and Sue, also included in that party, with Fred from across the street, Mary and her friend Joe, and Tanya. All of them happened to be members of the same Lutheran church a few blocks down the street, except Tanya. She worked at Bill's office and had become a friend of Bill's wife, Sue. In this backyard barbecue party, they were chattering away about the weather and the backyard landscaping, and then Bill happened to mention, I'm not really a fan of our church sign. It's not big enough to attract attention. Oh, and then the floodgates burst open and the quibbling began. Everybody had their own opinion. Fred said, my dad built that sign. Mary said, my dad paid for most of that sign. Joe said, I just helped repaint that sign. And that only led to more disagreements that followed. And they went on quibbling and quarreling about all the service times and about the pastor's choosing of hymns, and about 
whether the organist was playing the liturgy too slowly, and whether some liked the piano more than the organ. And then all of a sudden, Sue turned to Tanya and said, w would you like to come to church with us Sunday? <laughs> Who in their right mind would do that? You know, you can have ideas about what would help us here uh, do ministry better in our congregation. And I hope you do. We love to hear ideas on that. But keep in mind that your ideas and someone else's ideas would only help the church grow under God's gracious hand and blessing. He's the one who makes his church grow. To quibble and quarrel and complain, what good would that do? It would only be silly and fall right into Satan's trap. To be very honest, I have heard very little quibbling, quarreling, and complaining in all my many years here at Grace Church. But this portion of scripture raises the yellow caution flag and makes us pause and consider where quibbling, quarreling, and complaining come from. For the most part, my desire to have my opinion, my ideas, my agenda go my way, and to lord that over others and their opinions comes from my own personal insecurity. And personal insecurity betrays a flaw inside that is so deep that if we're honest about it, we finally would have to admit that differing opinions among people really are not that big a deal. What really counts is God's opinion about us. And if my insecurity bulges and bubbles out in either jealousy on the one hand or spite on the other, then God's opinion is just not his opinion. Then comes his judgment. You stink. And that would be his final opinion and his final word to us. If, if not for Jesus, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. My soul needs a powerful cleanser. And so does yours. Where are we going to get that soul cleansing power? VDMA. Verbum Domine Monet in Aeternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. The word that has the power to cleanse our souls so we can stand before our God. Ten years, three months, and 21 days ago, we cut the ribbon for the Grace Center next door. And immediately after we cut that ribbon, we heard mumblings. And we asked the crowd to be silent and to listen. And sure enough, we heard a conversation from parts of the building. The vents contested hotly. You need to have the HVAC people. Without them, you would have no heating or cooling. They're the most important people in building this building. The bricks built their case. The masons are the most important, or this building would have no shape. The woodwork hammered its point. Without the carpenters, this building would be unfinished and a mess. The painters spread the news. Without the painters, this building would be drab and ugly. And the windows made it clear. Without those who installed us, you wouldn't be able to look in or look out. But then the architect stepped up on a chair, waved his arms, and hollered, Be quiet! Stop arguing! The most important part of this building is the foundation! Some of you were there 10 years ago, right, Paul? And, uh, you know that I just made that story up. It's, 
as apocryphal as the story of Bell and the Dragon in the Apocrypha. Totally fabricated. When we dedicated the Gray Center, the building parts were not having a conversation and arguing. But if they were, that last point would be right on target. The building wouldn't stand, no building would stand, unless it has a solid foundation. The Apostle Paul was in the city of Ephesus across the Aegean Sea from Corinth, and word had sailed across over to him about the quibbling and quarreling going on in Corinth. So he wrote this letter in order to settle down the tensions and handle the issues. And he knew that some of the people in that church had a rural background, so he used this farm analogy of planting and watering because he knew that would strike home. But he also knew that many of the people in that congregation had transitioned from the farm to the city, from rural to urban, so he also transitioned his analogy. Listen to this. He writes, we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. Here's the transition. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is writing to people who were in transition, in turmoil. They needed, they needed hope for the future. They needed something solid, something stable, something sure to stand on. And what better foundation could there be than Jesus Christ? He is the apex, the focus, the center of the entire Bible. All of the Word of God focuses in on Jesus and His work for us. How would they have a solid foundation? V D M. A, verbum domini modet in aeternum, which is all about our Lord Jesus. Transitions in life lead to instability. Transitions can make people feel a bit on edge, like they're on shaky ground. There have been transitions in this downtown Milwaukee neighborhood where our church was planted 168 years ago. Transitions from a residential and industrial neighborhood of the 1930s into the blight and bleakness of the 1950s, and then another transition in the mid-1980s to renewal and rejuvenation, which is still continuing to this day. Will Grace Church endure? Will we continue in the future to be able to make a difference in this neighborhood? Two weeks from now, at our National Church Bodies Convention, there is a report that will be shared with the delegates that includes statistics about what's happening in our American society. Young people are getting married in general later in life. They're having fewer babies, and many of the young people in America are not interested in connecting with the church as an institution. How will that affect our future? And then there's the global pressure and persecution going on against Christianity, really all around the world. How does that make us feel moving forward in the future? And then there are transitions closer to home. Just within the last couple of weeks, we have added a new events director, replacing our dear Jean, who faithfully served for 10 years. Who could replace her? But we're praying for God's blessings on Tabitha and her efforts. And we have also hired a new full-time communications coordinator. And I don't think I have to go too far out on a limb to predict that 10 years from now, it's very likely here at Grace Church that we'll have a transition in who serves as minister of music, minister of discipleship, and senior pastor. Transitions can make some people a little nervous and on edge, wondering where are we going to have solid hope for the future. Two Sundays ago, I had the privilege of serving as a delegate at the triennial convention of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference held outside of Leipzig, Germany. Triennial means this group meets once every three years and they meet in different cities around the globe. We happen to be meeting outside of Leipzig, Germany two weeks ago. In this organization, the CELC, our Lutheran church body wells 
is partnered with 23 other Lutheran church bodies from around the globe, all committed to holding on to and proclaiming the entire, the whole Word of God. We're, there, were, there were representatives at this conference from Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, Peru, Puerto Rico, Portugal, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Latvia, Ukraine, Russia, Germany, the U.S., and more. Were there differences in language and culture? Of course. Was there evidence of persecution going on around the globe? Of course. All you had to do is listen to the stories of those who grew up behind the Iron Curtain before it came down in the eastern part of Germany, or the stories of those in Southeast Asia who cannot build and worship in a church but must worship in private in their homes because church buildings are illegal where they live, or listen to the stories of those who are threatened with arrest in Islamic-dominated countries. Where is the hope for the growth of God's church in the future? At the closing service, Pastor Martin Wilde, president of the Evangelische Lutherische Freikirche, EFLK, the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church, our sister church in Germany, preached the sermon in English, from memory, preached on the Hauptartikel of Scripture, the chief doctrine of Holy Scripture, and what is the chief doctrine of Holy Scripture other than God's forgiveness for sinners through Jesus Christ freely given. That message is the message of the entire Bible. The word of the Lord from cover to cover focuses on Jesus Christ and Him alone, the world's and our one and only Savior. So what could we do at that conference? And what can we do here at Grace Church other than confess our inner sin and insecurity and lay it at the foot of Jesus' cross for his blood to run over it and then stand shoulder to shoulder to receive Jesus' forgiveness in the Lord's Supper whenever it's offered and then to say our hellos and goodbyes in the full confidence that God's church will grow because VDMA, Verbum Domine Monad in Aeternum, the word of the Lord endures forever. And that word is in your heart and in your hands to hold and to share. Amen.